The Tom Woods Show, episode 1462. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Come on now, folks. If you ain't going to start that side hustle now, then when? Check out my free ebook, Five Paths to an Online Income, where I take you step by step through five things that I do that keep food on the Woods household table and how you can do them too. Check it out at pathstoincome.com. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. Very glad to have Phil Magnus back with us. Just such a great scholar. PhD from George Mason University School of Public Policy. We're going to be talking about his brand new book, co-authored with Jason Brennan, Cracks in the Ivory Tower, The Moral Mess of Higher Education. Phil, welcome back. Hey, Tom. Thanks for having me. I love your book, and in a way, I I kind of love it because it's not the book I thought it was going to be, okay. and I bet it's it's not the book that some folks th- think it will be. With that title, I thought, okay, it'll be about you know ideological conformity and political correctness and stuff like that. But it's so much deeper and more interesting than that. It it really is, in a way, at least in some of the analysis, like a public choice analysis of the university system. So it it goes into areas and and includes levels of analysis that would not have occurred to me. So that makes it a lot more fun, frankly, than the book I thought it would be, which I thought we'd have fun with too. Sure, sure. But but this one is much, much more interesting. So is it did it start off as a series of academic papers that you made into a book? Right. So uh, Jason Brennan, my co-author, and I, uh, we made a decision very early on that we were going to uh, set aside the ideological issues. Uh, I think the evidence is strong. that They're a prominent feature of the academic debate. Uh, but we came to the uh, conclusion very early on that uh, the issues we're addressing with the university system are much deeper, much more systemic, and they apply across the spectrum. So this is a book that someone on the far left – could read and find several things that they associate with, that they recognize as problems that they encounter in academic life. It could be something that a uh, conservative or a libertarian would uh, read and relate to on a similar basis. Uh, We first started the book um, as a project, a series of of earlier projects around 2015, 2016. Jason and I started investigating a major claim that was emerging in the academic press at the time, and that claim alleged that uh, university faculty were being adjunctified. Uh, Basically, tenure-track faculty were being either laid off or retired out of existence and replaced by these temporary part-time adjunct professors that uh, teach for very low wages by comparison. And this is supposedly a part of the ongoing corporatization or neoliberalization of the university system. And this is something that if you read something like the the Chronicle of Higher Education or Inside Higher Ed or any of the the, the trade presses that deal in this area, there's like a weekly article about uh, universities being adjunctified and taken over by the neoliberals. And we started to look at some of the statistical evidence behind this, the empirical data of what faculty hiring trends tended to show. And we discovered very early on that all of the claims that are being made in these uh, these newspapers and uh, journalistic think pieces are basically wrong. So we wrote a series of articles investigating the adjunct labor market in higher ed, and it revealed um, all sorts of interesting analysis. Some of it's the public choice uh, material that we delve into in the book. But uh, even more fundamental than that, we were trying to reorient the study of the higher ed job market and faculty employment to some actual statistical data instead of people just uh, philosophizing and offering unverified claims about what they think is going on. Let's put it to the test and actually see what the numbers say. Sure. Well, and that's that's indeed what's what you've done here. Now, in chapter 10, by the way, I'm just skipping ahead for one second. I was very happy to see that you and your co-author are as baffled as I am as to what the term neoliberalism is even supposed to be, right. <laughs> given the right. range of people it's applied to. And given that nobody describes himself as a neoliberal, that right off the bat tells you that it's a phony baloney word. If nobody actually uses it right. as a descriptor. Right. Right? It, it's Just, this junk throwaway term. And we actually offer a definition in the book. And basically what it comes down to is a neoliberal is anyone – that uh, the person using the term doesn't like in their political views. 
And often this uh, emerges on the very far left, people that uh, uh, consider any economics to the right of Karl Marx to be uh, something that's anathema and part of the corporatist capitalist system. But they apply this term neoliberal to describe uh, what they call a market ideology that's supposedly taken over the world and is supposedly uh, uh, running government, supposedly running universities. And even though they can't really say very much to specify what it is or what it does, they're absolutely certain that it's bad and that it's a wrong thing, that it's evil. Uh, so in the book, we, we refer to neoliberalism as one of the many poltergeist theories of, of uh, the academy. So you read article after article saying neoliberalism has taken over academia, and it's caused all of these problems, all of these bad things that are going on that can include everything from bad incentives, misleading advertising, uh, stuff like the uh, the tuition and, and admissions uh, scandal that, that, that rocked some of the Ivy League's schools earlier this year, tuition, student loan crisis and debt, everything that we see about the university system that people think of as bad, and some of these are very real problems, but for very different reasons, what they'll come in and they say, this is evidence of neoliberalism, and neoliberalism is the cause of all of the turmoil. So it's like a poltergeist, which is an imaginary spirit that inhabits a house and throws things around, knocks dishes out of the cabinet, uh, tears up paper in the middle of the night. But poltergeists are not real. So one of the arguments we make in the book is neoliberalism is very similar. It's a, a commonly blamed term and concept, but it doesn't really mean anything, and there's no evidence that it actually exists. I want to skip – I'm going to do chapter three before chapter two. Mm -hmm. Chapter three is about academic advertising. That is the right. kind of claims that are made – Let's say on the on the website of a of or in the literature of a university. Now, as you point out, not every university does this, but a lot of them do. I oh, mean, yeah. Maybe most of them do. And the kinds of claims they make for what they are going to do for you, maybe because we've a lot of us have imbibed the the religion of the university, we don't even stop to notice how absurdly over the top these claims are. But the way when you just lay them out one after the other, you think, yeah, really, what are we falling for? Who, who could who could transform a person in the way they promise to right. transform you? Right. It's a um, it's almost negligent in the way that universities market themselves. And I'd add on to that uh, the evidence tends to point towards the, uh, the the elite institutions. Universities at the top are some of the worst participants in this trend. So everyone has this uh, conceptualization of higher ed as a, um, a thing that's tied to the advancement of knowledge, very lofty goals, very head in the clouds, uh, better yourself by becoming a more well-rounded and educated person. Uh, so that myth mythology is there. It, it's kind of ling lingering in the background, and it's why some of these appeals uh, that are attached to university programs gain such currency. But what we find is uh, most colleges and universities will seize onto this and offer uh, these fantastical claims about how if you attend such and such university for four years, you will open a, a new horizon of, of work and educational opportunities. You'll expand your career beyond your wildest dreams. It's, it's really almost over-the-top comical types of slogans that are put out by these uh, these institutions. And yet, if you actually look at the data, look at the returns on a degree, almost nobody accomplishes any of these things that are being promised. In fact, if there, there are some uh, attempts to measure the before and after effects of an education in college, and people are entering in as freshmen and then leaving four years later, having learned barely anything, in some cases, especially math skills, uh, there seems to be actually a retraction. They uh, they devolve in their understanding of mathematical numeracy from where they were in high school. Uh, so the reality, the output of universities is not at all aligning with some of the advertising claims that we get in here. So we ask the question, why is this the case? And it turns out it's, a, it's very closely tied to financial and institutional incentives. So uh, the Ivy Leagues, as I mentioned, are some of the worst offenders of this. They actually adopt a strategy where they, they will mail out uh, glossy brochures and invitation letters to, uh, to solicit applications from students that they have no intention whatsoever of admitting into their program. And it may be students at, uh, at uh, lower ranked schools. It may be students that uh, do not have the financial means to enter into Harvard or Yale or Princeton. Uh, but uh, it, it's people that are, are, are basically not in the cohort that they're actually trying and intending to admit, and yet they'll flood them with brochures saying, you too can go to Harvard, you too can go to Yale and be among the educated elite of our society at the very top ranked institution. 
the reason they do this is the incentives and in, in institutional structures of the university system. So U.S. News and World Report and several other um, entities rank order programs and departments and universities uh, and publish this as part of the uh, the elite prestige that all these schools are seeking to obtain. And one of the metrics that they use to bump up a school in terms of eliteness is its rejection rate of applicants. So you start thinking, here's the public choice dimension. If Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Stanford and all these elite schools want to maintain their place on the top of that uh, that list, at the top of the university rankings, it actually makes sense for them to encourage far more applicants than they could ever hope to admit, they ever intend to admit, and then reject the majority of them because that, that makes them more exclusive and it boosts their rankings. And that's just one of many uh, similar types of incentives that causes universities to do these things. But the the uh, the, the ethical implication of it is is that they're making uh, really false and uh, and negligent promises to students, uh, wasting students' times, wasting potential applicants' time and efforts and money uh, as they're trying to to uh, to gain admission to schools that have no intention of admitting them. And it's all just to game the ranking system so they can be better off in uh, uh, in the eyes of U.S. News and World Report or can uh, be better off in the competition against their peer schools in maintaining that eliteness of their credential. I want to make sure we get to – there's so many things I want to get to in this limited time. In chapter two, you talk about what faculty want and what students want. Right. Can you lay out a little bit of that? Right. So faculty want a job, and they want a good, well-paying, comfortable job. It may not necessarily be something that's uh, uh, high six figures, although uh, you get to, into some elite institutions, that type of thing is offered. But uh, you know, a typical faculty member wants to – settle into a position that they can occupy for 30 or 40 years of their life, get paid well, reasonably well, uh, get to do self-directed research, uh, get to write about things and study things that interest them, uh, get to teach classes on those same subjects and do so with uh, you know the, the, the security that comes with either a tenure appointment or the benefits that come with academic life. If you think about it, it's, it's actually a pretty cushy uh, position to, to, if you can secure a full-time job in academia because that means what? You've got uh, basically two semesters of teaching obligations that run roughly September through December and then late January through about the beginning of May. You have the whole summer off and you have a month off in, in the winter for um, uh, basically the break period. And uh, on top of that, you have all sorts of uh, institutional support for your research. Uh, you have a paycheck to study things that uh, you probably couldn't get paid to do in any other circumstance beyond academia. Um, you have basically a, a position where you're set for life and it's very difficult to fire you unless you do something almost criminal in most systems that, uh, that offer tenure uh, before they would uh, lay you off with cause. So it's uh, everything about academic life is very appealing to faculty. And what this means is as long as faculty positions are available out there, it's an attractive career path for lots and lots of people uh, that want to seek that type of a pursuit. And in fact, there are more seekers of academic jobs almost every given year than there are available positions to fill them. And that creates a bit of a job market glut of applicants that are coming in here. So that's on the faculty side. Uh, they want uh, the good life. They want a, um, a comfortable salary doing what uh, they like to research, studying what they like to study. Uh, students are seeking, uh, they're in there for their credential. Uh, most students go to school not because they want to sit around and spend a lifelong uh, period learning the great books and studying the ancient texts or anything, even though everyone will say that lofty ideal. They want to get in, get their degree in four to five years, and enter into the job market because uh, major sectors of the job market require some form of credential, some form of college degree to access them. And this changes and varies from field to field, but uh, by and large, degrees do yield a premium in salary and a premium in, in, in employment uh, if, you, if you take that out on your resume, uh, even to the, the, the extent that a, a typical undergraduate degree is, is fairly fungible for most entry-level professional jobs uh, unless they require an, a, a very specific expertise such as, uh, for example, nursing or um, engineering or something that has a skill associated with it. But uh, if you want to go work at GEICO, you want to go work in a managerial real position at a, um, a corporation or typical firm, an undergraduate degree is often the main entry point there. So uh, students are looking for that credential 
and the university is there to provide it, is there to uh, to give it to them, but it also comes at a cost. There's heavy tuition involved. There's the time commitment. There's the deferred earnings that you have uh, by not entering into the workforce at 18 or 19 and instead pushing that back to 23 or 24. So these two different uh, components come together in the university system underneath a uh, an administrative bureaucracy laid on top of that. And they don't work very well in a typical market fashion. So one of the points we make in the book is a university offers a product that it does not directly sell. The faculty are not involved in the pricing of that product in any reasonable way. Uh, They may tangentially know what tuition is, but that's about it. And the students aren't really directly paying for the product either. They're going through second and third party payers, such as a, a, a student loan provider, or in some cases it's the government, or in some cases it's their parents that are actually uh, footing the bill to send them to college. Uh, so this creates a very weak uh, form of market signals between what the faculty are providing and what the students actually want. So uh, one of the results of this um, uh, incentive structure is faculty will be drawn toward offering very niche upper level types of classes that are appealing to them and interesting to them and the subjects that they, that they study, but very few students want to take those classes. Um, at the same time, students are seeking to fulfill gen ed requirements or maybe seeking to fulfill something very specific to a degree that they want, uh, but it's not necessarily being offered. And instead, they're a- actually having to take all this other required superfluous, uh, in some cases, fluff of courses of their curriculum to actually get into their major uh, to finish their degree. So a degree that that would have taken two or three years studying only in that major is drawn out to four or five years because you have to take half a dozen English classes, two sciences, a math, and all the other core requirements that are unrelated to it. Well, that actually brings me to all the way up to chapter six, because what you were just describing is a case of, of, in a way, ships passing in the night. But what's interesting about chapter six is uh, chapter six is called "When Moral Language Disguises Self-Interest." There you right. have a case of of the faculty wanting something, maybe for their own reasons, and the students, for idealistic reasons, happen to wind up wanting the same thing. And what you point out in there is that it's not always the case that people consciously say, "I'm acting uh, in my self-interest." A lot of times, we convince ourselves that, "No, no, no. Why I'm acting on behalf of of, of extremely admirable, uh, you know, abstract principles or whatever." Well, okay, that's the way the human brain is. But you point out that there is reason to believe that perhaps some types of campaigns on college campuses might be motivated on the faculty side by something other than pure devotion to abstract principles. Right. And this actually comes through in quite a few of the recent protest letters and protest movements that we've seen. And I don't want to take an ideological stance on on these causes, although most of them do come from the political left. But we ask the question, what are students after when they sign a petition of demands that they present to administrators? And if you actually look at those petitions of demands, some of the primary recurring themes are requests for new faculty lines, new uh, new staff lines that they want the administrators to employ, or they, maybe they want a, new, a creation of a new center or a new department that supposedly services students, but it's really providing more jobs for uh, uh, a glutted job market in a specific uh, research area or discipline. So uh, one of the questions we ask, because even though these are often presented in, uh, here are our list of demands to service justice on this university and rectify injustices that we've faced as students. Uh, you can fulfill, fulfill those demands by hiring three new English professors, creating a diversity center, and staffing the Environmental Sustainability Office. Uh, something doesn't quite add up here. And the typical student is probably not being serviced by uh, um, expanding the university budget to uh, create all these little niche programs that don't really have much of a student base in them, uh, but rather are uh, spending vast amounts of money on employing new faculty and employing new staff. So what it ends up being uh, a case of is uh, these highly moralistic student demand letters uh, are seeking much more self-interested goals of certain faculty that have have kind of co-opted some of these movements and brought them into uh, uh, their areas of influence. So it's it's kind of a way of rent-seeking the university system to get resources reallocated to pet projects. 
And whenever that happens, where does the cost for it fall? It's not on the faculty that are involved. They're actually beneficiaries. And it's often not on the small number of students that are in the protest group. Rather, it's spread across the entire student body and tuition, or it's spread onto the taxpayers because uh, higher ed is a multi-trillion dollar industry with massive amounts of, uh, of public money involved in it. So it's kind of a, a, a servicing of the desire for rents for a very small constituency by spreading it onto very large swaths of people that are impacted by higher education. Well, I wonder if we might be able to say something like the same thing about chapters seven and eight. So you've mm -hmm. got the gen ed hustle and why universities produce too many PhDs. Now, I remember when I got, arrived at Columbia for my PhD, we were sat down and I think it was Ken Jackson, who might have been the department chairman at the time, who basically said to us, I don't know why you're here. Right. There are no jobs. Right. I mean, he was frank enough with us. He said, look, there are no jobs out there. I mean, you're at Columbia and there's a decent chance we can help you out. And, you know, the name might get you somewhere, but it's really, really hard. Now, it's very rare to get a talk like that. Right. Uh, so and, and there are reasons for that. And there are and some of them are purely self-interested reasons. And so you have a chapter on that and then you have a chapter on gen ed courses and again it's like the chapter on academic advertising these gen ed courses are portrayed as things that are going to expose you to all kinds of wonderful avenues of knowledge right. and whatever and then you look at the real motivation probably behind why you have them and it's a bit more prosaic right right so i can start on the gen ed uh question and almost everyone that goes through colleges knows what gen eds are for roughly the first two years of your undergrad experience you're not in your major you're actually going through this checklist of all these courses that you have to require to become a well-educated well-rounded uh, participant in the university system and it may be a list of you have to take three english courses two history courses two science one math uh, and so forth and it's presented as this uh, this knowledge expanding um, component of, of an education. A school wants every undergraduate to have this baseline of knowledge. It's also presented as a um, an experimental phase to discover your own route through the university. But what we find is when we actually dig into the numbers of it, uh, the courses that are are most heavily represented on the Gen Ed curriculum are also the courses that have the most difficulty attracting majors. So uh, the one that we use uh, the main example of, and it's because the, the best data exists, is writing composition. And uh, you can go back to the 1970s, and uh, there was a survey administered of um, across the United States of colleges and universities, and they asked them, how many courses do they require in writing composition? And the typical university said, oh, yes, we do require that, and it, and it amounts to one semester. They readministered the same survey 30 years later. And they find that the writing uh, requirements in the gen ed curriculum across the United States have basically doubled in the course of 30 years. So now it's at least two semesters, sometimes as much as three semesters of a required writing class. So we ask the question, why is this going on? To complicate the matter further, there's substantial evidence that the people that are taking these classes in, in uh, introductory writing composition are getting next to nothing out of them. Uh, in other words, there are tests that are administered the first week of freshman year where they uh, they ask you to write an essay and do some uh, critical thinking exercises, and then they, then they score it. And then they come back uh, two years later at the end of your sophomore year and have readministered the same test, and they find there's no material improvement. There's no change over the course of uh, two years of college when all of these gen ed writing classes have been administered. They also ask employers that are hiring new undergraduates that are freshly minted out of college to evaluate their writing skills. And it's consistently rated as one of the worst problems coming out of higher ed. That students think that they can write, but almost none of them have any uh, skills in that department and are often uh, in need of remedial instruction when they get on their job from their employers on how to improve their writing skills. So over the course of 30 years, we've had uh, the number of required credits that you have to take in, in writing dramatically increase, but it doesn't seem to have any effect whatsoever in any, any measure of outcomes. So we're asking the question, why is this the case? Well, it turns out that writing is a good way to fill the so-called butts and seats metric of a department's budget. Uh, it's a good way to get students into the English department, which is facing a decline in the number of majors, the number of students that are choosing to go into English. And you see this in other departments as well. Foreign languages is another one that's shown similar trends. 
Uh, there are also gen eds in the humanities that are offered as supposedly these self-discovery courses, but what you find is they're almost always taught by faculty in disciplines that have declining majors. So what it ends up being is even though there's a, this high and lofty goal of making the well-educated citizen, they're not really delivering on that education, but they are making forced consumers of these disciplines that uh, uh, of classes that people would never otherwise take under their own volition. Uh, things that students do not find as popular or worthwhile of their own time, but they're required to do it because it checks a box to get their credential at the end of the day. So that's a recurring theme that we see in academia. And the ethical issue here is, is it fair to require a student to take a class that he or she does not need, pay for that class just to keep an abundance of English professors employed or an abundance of foreign language professors uh, employed or keep a, a struggling department afloat when it's failing to attract majors to its own uh, area of study. And we, we, you know, we argue that this is probably an ethical problem. It's probably an area where you're extracting money out of people that are 18 or 19 years old, just entering into adult life and are not in the best financial situations to keep uh, reasonably well-educated, uh, middle-class, mid-career professors employed and expand the ranks of those professors. Uh, so that's certainly there. Now we can switch over to the faculty side. So why do PhD programs produce too many PhDs? And the simple answer here is, again, incentives. All of the incentives uh, behind the maintenance of a PhD program conflict with the realities of the academic job market. And this is especially bad in the humanities and some of the social sciences. So areas like English, history, philosophy, these are subjects that sometimes produce 1.5 to two times as many PhDs in a given year than they could actually employ and absorb in the job market. And it's important to note that this is not because of a decline in academic jobs. It's rather uh, the, the new PhD entrants into these areas are growing at such a fast pace that every year it uh, consens consistently outpaces the number of new jobs. So even though new jobs in English and history and all these other areas are going up in numbers, the new PhDs that are applying for them are growing at a much faster rate. So uh, you have a, a massive employment struggle. Uh, but there's a reason behind that. There's a reason why programs continue to operate and issue PhDs even though they know – from a fact, as, as your advisor told you the first year, uh, that most of the people in that classroom will never get an academic job. Uh, there just simply aren't enough of them to go around. And the reason is PhD programs provide all sorts of incentives for people who teach in PhD programs and people who administer PhD programs. Uh, it's a prestige thing. So if you are a university professor at even a, a low-ranked third-tier state university, but it has a PhD program in – creative writing or philosophy or history or some other subject area, uh, you are automatically in a more prestigious uh, uh, level or tier than compared to uh, maybe your grad school buddy who teaches at a four-year liberal arts college that doesn't have that program attached to it. Uh, most states fund uh, universities with PhD programs at a higher level than they do uh, four-year colleges in the public cases. And almost always across the board, faculty that teach in PhD programs make a higher salary than uh, those who do not. It also comes with benefits. You get graduate assistance to teach your classes and grade your papers. You get prestige to brag about to your colleagues and other departments and other fields, all sorts of perks that come with the job that do benefit the faculty. And what this means is faculty have an incentive to keep around a, a, an underperforming PhD program, even as a terrible record of placing its graduates in academic jobs. Uh, so PhD programs proliferate. They continue to issue uh, degrees far in excess of what the job market can sustain in academia, and they do so for mainly self-interested reasons. Uh, yet at the same time, the students that are graduating from those programs are going out into the academic job market and discovering, lo and behold, I'm competing against 400 other people for this one job. Yeah, indeed. I, I well remember that myself, as a matter of fact. <laughs> now, on a somewhat unrelated note, I was interested to see a chapter on student evaluations of all things. Yes. <laughs> and what I like about this is that you and Jason start the chapter by pointing out we both got excellent uh, student evaluation. So this is not sour grapes. And you reproduce the, your actual evaluation. So you're not uh, complaining that you got bad ones and that's why you don't like them. Um, I got great evaluations. I'm really happy about that. But I don't know, there was always something about the process that 
left me a little wary and cold, but I, I couldn't quite articulate it. So, to, I mean, it sounds like it should be a sensible thing, right? I mean, sure. students have sure. sat in your classroom and, and shouldn't they, after all, we have all these different review websites for different products and services. So why not student evaluations? No, that's a, exactly the question that uh, we present in the book. Uh, so student evaluations are often used in hiring decisions. They're used in employment and promotion decisions. They want to continue or keep you on a contract. So they're a very big part of the academic employment market. Anyone who's taught knows this process. When you prepare your application packet, you select your best evaluations and you stress that as proof that you can teach. But what we find if you review all the empirical literature – about student evaluations is that they're very unreliable about what they even signify, almost to the point of being incoherent. And when they do signal something, it's almost always uh, perverse incentives. It's almost always something that you would not want to use in hiring. So there are several studies, for example, that reveal that students tend to reward professors who are seen as easy or seen as engaging or seen as, uh, you know, throwing them softball assignments. Uh, uh, this is just a very natural thing. The easy graders, uh, for example, that's a, that's a way to, to uh, uh, ensure that you get strong evaluations. Meanwhile, if you're a, a very hard grader, if you're uh, if you're seen as difficult or maybe you assign long uh, term papers or, or serious problem sets that are time consuming, that tends to be docked on student evaluations. And I ask the question, if our goal is to educate students and, and better prepare them in those subject areas, do you want the easy grader or the hard grader? And most people will say, well, the hard grader is actually applying some sort of challenge to them, making them learn the material, whereas the easy grader may be throwing out A's just to maintain his or her popularity. Uh, that creates a bit of a, um, a perverse incentive if uh, you're a faculty member and you want to ensure that you get good, solid evaluations. Great inflation, you know, there, there's mixed evidence about how severe it is or whether uh, it's a as pervasive of a problem as it's always rumored to be. But one thing is certain that the easy graders do tend to, to uh, perform higher on uh, student evaluations than hard graders. Uh, there are also some evidence uh, that's brought in uh, from a few experimental studies and empirical analysis. They found that sometimes students actually discriminate against people, uh, uh, faculty based on their gender or even their race, uh, so something that would be very unethical to use, and, and it could be completely unrelated to uh, the quality of the actual teaching in the classroom, but uh, uh, female professors, for example, are, are often evaluated more harshly than male professors in, uh, in the student forms that they fill out at the end of the semester. So we make the point that uh, at best, student evaluations are a really distorted signal that's not giving you very good information at all. And at worst, it may actually be unethical to use that information because it skews and it biases toward uh, picking up characteristics that we would never want to make a, uh, a hiring decision on, such as racial or gender discrimination or such as blowing off a class and making it easy uh, for the students to uh, to falsely incentivize or, or, or change the way that they evaluate you as, a, as opposed to actually teaching the material. So uh, bringing in all these ethical considerations, it may be the case that universities are hiring and promoting faculty on all of the wrong decisions, all of the wrong metrics. And if that's true, it'd probably be better to scrap the evaluation system entirely and uh, and choose faculty on something different, uh, such as uh, uh, the quality of their research or their reputability and actually showing up and teaching their classes as expected, as opposed to this very manipulable and uh, and probably not very accurate uh, synopses of, uh, of evaluations that come in at the end of the semester. When you write a book like this, you'll get people saying, all right, maybe some of your criticisms are valid, but do you have something to offer more than criticisms? Is Are there reforms that are plausible that would work? Are there reforms that are not plausible that would work? Or are there no reforms that would work? Right. So there are always opportunities for reform around the edges. And one of the things we do in the final chapter of the book is we pose as an open-ended question, where are the payers in the higher ed system standing? And that devolves into two areas. That's uh, first the students that are paying directly in tuition. Are they getting what they expect to and what they uh, what they deserve in return for the actual payment that they're putting out to the university system? And then the broader question, the taxpayers, because higher ed is so thoroughly subsidized and connected to uh, government provision of um, of monies for its budget. And this is 
above and beyond uh, anything that we're expecting out of the the next presidential contest where you have all these candidates that are uh, offering free tuition or universal student debt forgiveness. Uh, even as it exists right now, it's a multi-trillion dollar industry where uh, several hundreds of billions of dollars come from the taxpayers. So we ask the question, where are these two very clear stakeholders, the students and the taxpayers, in the equation? And oftentimes they're pushed aside. They're pushed aside for rent seekers within the university system that are aiming to expand their budget or secure the number of jobs in their department or make their life more cushy, more uh, uh, friendly to a a high-minded academic research life without really providing much of a return to students. And this misalignment of incentives is really one of the main major factors of why higher ed costs are going up. So we ask the question, what would a university look like if uh, if student tuition payments were actually connected to the course that they pay for? Uh, this was an idea first proposed by Adam Smith. Uh, back in the Wealth of Nations, in uh, and this, he's writing in the 1770s. He made an observation when he taught at two different universities, Oxford and then, then the University of Glasgow, that they had different ways that the faculty were were paid. And at Oxford, all the faculty were paid a uniform rate across the board. Then at Glasgow, they had a component of the tuition the students paid based on a per class basis. So the uh, professors that were seen as offering the greater value to them got paid more. Uh, it actually connected some sort of a price mechanism to it. Now, that may be really hard to implement in our current higher ed system, but it's an idea that's worth considering. Maybe even more uh, uh, close to realistic, uh, I'd, I'd propose, for example, reevaluating the number of gen ed requirements that students have to take to qualify for a degree or relaxing some of the requirements attached to that. So uh, if you could fulfill your gen eds by applying them toward a major that you intend to take, you might be able to knock a year or a year and a half off of your college experience. And in doing so, reduce your tuition by 30, 40, $50,000. That puts you at a, um, a much less pronounced financial disadvantage than someone who's required to take four to five years of, uh, of classes that are mostly superfluous for the first couple of years of that because they're, uh, they're required uh, to go through all these courses in the English department or the foreign language department, history department that are there not because uh, they're enriching the students, but because they're, uh, uh, they're securing a job and securing a teaching function for departments that are losing majors. So we do ask questions like that. Uh, We also ask questions about university administrative bloat, uh, which has gone up in astronomical rates since the 1970s. And it's mostly low-level staff and student services and student affairs uh, and offering things like uh, uh, departments of recreation or departments of of, uh, environmental sustainability. So there's some political causes attached to these. Uh, They create a massive bloated bureaucracy in almost every university system that exists. But uh, very little of this return actually goes back to the students themselves and their educational experience, and yet they're all paying for it. So we asked the question, maybe we should consider cutting some of these areas of the university to uh, recoup on the budget and transfer that back in uh, tuition rebates to uh, students that are actually paying for it. Uh, So you ask a question, everything's a fixed budget in the university system. It's a lot like a government bureaucracy. And in areas where budgets are fixed, there have to be necessary trade-offs. So if a university is spending a million dollars a year on the environmental sustainability office to install recycling bins and carbon reduction initiatives around uh, campus, that's probably employing a very large staff. What if you took that money and gave it in tuition rebates to poor minority students that were underserviced uh, by the university system? What's the better return on that? And I'd argue that the ethical case is almost always to go toward the students rather than providing jobs for uh, people in this uh, this little political cause of a bureaucracy that's attached itself to the university system. So asking questions that that are barely even broached in the subject today, I think is the first starting point of getting some of this uh, expense explosion in higher ed under control and reining in some of the ethical problems. Phil, tell people what your website is, uh, the domain. Yeah, it's philmagnus.com. That's P-H-I-L-M-A-G-N-E-S-S.com. And I also write pretty frequently about higher ed issues at at, uh, American Institute for Economic Research where I work, and that's AIER.org. 
Okay, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff that comes out of AIER as well. Well, the book is Cracks in the Ivory Tower, The Moral Mess of Higher Education by Jason Brennan and Phil Magnus. Well, best of luck with it. And I'm glad it's not the book I was expecting because the book <laughs> I was expecting has already been written. Yeah, but this, that, th- you know, this one hadn't. We may be doing a... A volume two in the future. Ah, okay. That, uh, that does take up the ideological question. <laughs> well, the thing is, I bet there's stuff out there that, you know, I follow it a little bit. But there's no way I can know all the horror stories out there. So that would that would have its place. But I enjoyed reading a book that raised uh, questions and, and offered perspectives that, that even I, a, a critic of uh, the way higher education has operated for so long, uh, had not thought of. So it was, it was definitely a, a good use of my time. So thanks again. Thanks. All right, folks, something amusing for you as we wrap up this week. Remember, next week is Brian McClanahan week on the show. So we're going to be having historian Brian McClanahan every episode next week, and we've got some great topics lined up. It's going to be a lot of fun. He is the most underrated scholar in our movement. we got a lot of overrated ones. Uh, Brian's the opposite. But I want to tell you about BryceofSomeTrades.com. He's kind of a jack of all trades or some trades. And he says, if there's one thing I'm good at, it's becoming above average at way too many different things. I'm like a living B movie, goofy humor and unexpected wonders, purposely low quality with random bits of greatness. He says, I am probably the only Christian goth libertarian metalhead in the world, but someone's got to keep people in these groups on their toes. I'm certified in science apologetics and regularly study economics, philosophy, theology, politics, and science. My site has writings on many of these topics and others, all kinds of stuff there. He says, Bryce of some trade, some weird guy posting random things on a random website. You'll love it and hate it. Well, with that promotion, how can you not check out Bryce, B-R-Y-C-E, BryceofSomeTrades.com. I'll link to that at TomWoods.com slash 1462. Now, of course, one thing Bryce is good at is getting publicity for his website. And he did that by getting his hosting through me, which he got a great deal on. And then he gets publicity, gets some traffic, he gets membership in my bloggers group. He gets a lot of nice bonuses. So you can get those bonuses. Now, first of all, I'll link to BryceofSomeTrades.com at TomWoods.com slash 1462. You can get these bonuses for yourself through TomWoods.com slash publicity. Thanks for listening. See you next week for the Brian McClanahan week of the Tom Woods Show. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.